Well, I just want to begin by thanking Ebony for bringing me out. Dr. Zamani Gallagher um, is a very close friend and has a just been a real um, important supporter in my own research and in my career. I remember the first time I met her at a conference, she's a, you know, just real affirming, real validating. And I was like, okay, you know, I, I, I could see myself fitting into this scholarly community. So I just uh, wanna recognize that. So uh, the title of my presentation is Advancing Equitable Student Outcomes, Building Institutional Capacity in Engaging Males of Color. Um, I'm Luke Wood as a, Dr. Zamani Gallagher already said. You'll notice that I, I listed uh, Frank Harris, who I do a lot of my work with um, on this presentation as well, though he's not here. Um, our work is at this point almost one body of work, so I, I can't talk about what I do without talking about what he does since it's so interrelated. So, so we'll go ahead and begin. So uh, for those of you who are active on Twitter, <laughs> You can feel free to uh, use the hashtag M2C3. Does a, the research club team have a, a hashtag they use ongoing? Yes, um, at OCCRL. Okay, so hashtag o, at, OCC, or at OCCRL for the Twitter handle. And then uh, here's mine if you want to use it. I always put this up just in case people are on their phones. Like I can always pretend like, oh, well, maybe they're tweeting about it. <laughs> 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 Instead of doing work. <laughs> All right. so. Uh, the work that I do is focused on black males and Latino males and other men of color, particularly in community colleges, though um, I'm also very interested in what is taking place in K-12 and even more so recently what's taking place in early childhood. Um, so I thought it was important to, to start out any conversation with, with um, the focus on males of color by talking about early on, like what do we see that's taking place. These are just some, some data, uh, NAEP data from grade level four. Um, and one of the things that it points out, just looking at some of the disparities that we already know are taking place, just to kind of orient us to why we have a focus on males of color. So you can see here that for black males, uh, those who are at proficient or above, there's about 15% in comparison to about 42% for white males, right? We see these patterns, everyone's probably seen this, these kind of patterns before. We see the very similar patterns in math. They progress to eighth grade, where then they, of course, start getting worse, which then uh, one of the reasons that we know that's taking place is because of challenges in, in disciplinary practices, uh, educators who aren't really uh, prepared to work with the population. Um, of course, there's external pressures to the students and their lives, but I don't really focus on that with my work. I really focus on what the institution's doing. So one of the things that we know that K-12 st students are doing to our students, to our students of color in particular, um, is that they are experiencing exclusionary discipline at different rates. Um, so I have uh, three, three children, and one of my children is my, my son, his name is Luke, right? And he's in preschool. And I've seen him at times where he's done things, and other boys who have done similar things who don't share his uh, ethnic background, and where what he's done has been pathologized as he's being deviant, he's being aggressive. Um, I've seen it where he's walked up and kids are hugging one another. He gives a kid a hug and people are like, oh wait, what is he doing? Is he up to no good? And so we know that these things occur early on. I, I definitely see the patterns um, is, you know, in preschool, but we know that in terms of data, we see that you know, uh, you know, it's not really showing up on this actually, in terms of, I guess, the. Um, the convergence between the two different sets. But, uh, but basically what you should see is that there's 5% for white males who are suspended, 15% for black males, and 7% for Latino males, and that black males are suspended at three times uh, the rate that their uh, white male peers are. Right, so we know that's taking place, and, well, expelled, I should say. So we know that they're being excluded oftentimes from the classroom. I can relate to this personally. When I was in uh, sixth grade, I was suspended for more days than I was actually in school. And a lot of it was like literally, I, I went to a predominantly white school um, other than myself, my twin brother, and, and a guy named Percy, right? So that gives you an idea of how many there, of us there were. So because of that, Right, um, you know, a lot of things that we did were were pathologized, and so I can relate to these patterns because I, I I too experienced it in my own educational experience. Here's data from the Schott Foundation looking at graduation rates for Black males. You see, 52% uh, that graduated. This is a, a four-year time frame, which of course, if we look at 
um, beyond a four-year time frame, you see these numbers jump up. But still, I mean, I think that's what we should be looking at. Latino males, 58%, and then white males is 78%. Uh, and these are data here from the College Board. A couple years ago, they did a report that essentially was looking at pathways after high school. What, where do people go after high school, all right? And they said, well, there's six primary pathways when we're talking about um, uh, males of color. And, they, and this uh, chart here is on African-American males, but they had them on other ethnic groups as well if you want to go check out the report. But one of the things you'll see is that about 33% are going into post-secondary education, all right? Uh, Less than 1% going into the military. 21% are employed. So we could say that everything on the top there are pretty positive outcomes. On the bottom, we have our outcomes that aren't so positive. Unemployment, 34%. Incarceration, 9.9%. And then death. Now, one of the things that I, I think I have, I've had a problem with this report on from the beginning is that those employment numbers uh, don't take into account underemployment, which is chronic in communities of color. Um, so I think uh, if, if it were me, I would have disaggregated that out. But I still think it helps to show a picture of why folks are doing work in this area. Now, there's been this conversation about why are we focusing on males, right? Well, one of the things they wanted to do was help to contextualize why we're having this focus. And so we know, that, and so on this left-hand side here, we see our data that are spe uh, specific to overrepresentation for men, and on the right-hand side, overrepresentation for women. So men, African-American men specifically, are more likely to be, to, to be represented in the military, unemployment, incarceration, and death in comparison to their female peers. On the right-hand side, you'll see for women more likely to be represented in post-secondary education and employment. So this helps to just kind of provide some context to, to what we're seeing. So in light of this, and in light of a lot of the work that's being done around the country, the Obama administration started the My Brother's Keeper initiative. How many people here have heard of My Brother's Keeper? All right, great, every hand. You'll be surprised, sometimes uh, Frank and I will go to colleges and we'll ask, and not a single per person will raise their hand. So, um, so it's, well, it's always interesting to see the differences. So basically, the purpose of My Brother's Keeper is to do what? To increase outcomes for boys and men of color in society, focus on education, focus on healthcare, focus on criminal justice, right? Um, our work also kind of intersects with this uh, national focus on community colleges as well. Uh, Obama administration has done a lot towards um, community college. In fact, if you haven't read it, Dr. Zamani Gallagher uh, published a book uh, a couple years ago now, or last year, that focused on the Obama administration and education reform, and a large contingent of what he's done has focused on the community colleges and the role that they have in, in producing outcomes. So. My work really falls at kind of the nexus of these two areas, community colleges and, and males of color. And so um, with Frank Harris, uh, we started M2C3 in 2011. So we're aware of these national trends that are going on with males of color. And we also are concerned with um, essentially the, the, what's not um, being focused on, which is, we felt was the community college. So we started a center to basically work with community colleges to help them to improve their capacity to serve this population. So, and these are just some of the rationales that we had for starting M2C3. One, uh, across the country there was a proliferation of what we call minority male initiatives. Programs, activities, services focused on men, men of color in community colleges. So much so that the American Association of Community Colleges started a database in 2010 just to start cataloging everything that was going on because there was so much that was taking place. Then we also um, were concerned about the lack of context-specific insights that were informing the development of these programs. What do I mean by that? Well, we would go to a community college and we would say, hey, you got this program that's focused on black males or this program that's focused on Latino males. Where did you get that program model? Like, oh yeah, well we saw this article about what was taking place at Ohio State and we thought that would be good here. Or there was this program at Stanford that we heard about and we thought, hey, we should do the same thing here. Now, for anybody who's done work on community colleges, you would know that that translation does not necessarily work. The, the population of men of color in community colleges is very distinct from that of other institution types, right? They're more likely to be older. Average age is 28 to 29 years old. Right? They're more likely to have dependents, more likely to be independents, more likely to be married, typically have lower levels of preparation in terms of prior educational coursework. Uh, degree expectations are different. So we're talking about different worlds. 
So we would find out that, hey, they would say the program's not working. And we were like, well, yeah, we have some rationale as to why that might be occurring. The program model is based upon a population that you simply are not serving here. Um, the other thing is the role that masculinities has in, um, in outcomes for this population. In our work, we focus on masculinities um, and we measure masculinities even in our assessment data in three different ways. First, uh, we look at help seeking. We know that in general, um, some men are apprehensive to seek out help, to ask for help, um, and to accept help and follow through with it when it's offered. And the reason that that is, is we've been socialized to believe that by doing so makes you weak or inferior, or in some cases um, being viewed as feminine, right? And masculine socialization oftentimes paints anything that's feminine as being bad and something that you shouldn't view as positive. So because of that, a lot of men are apprehensive to seek out help. And we looked at the role that that has in student success. We also recognize that there's an intersection there with race, right? Where we know that some men who are of color are also even more apprehensive to seek out help because they're worried about reifying stereotypes that suggest that they're academically inferior. We also um, look at the role that um, gender has in, in painting uh, schools and colleges as a, as a domain that's more suited for some groups than others. And we refer to it as gender, uh, school as a gender neutral domain. So if we look at the population of K-12 teachers, um, what is the predominant uh, gender? Female, all right. What is the predominant race? Right, okay. So we're talking about white female population, and we're talking about males of color. So we think that there might be some disconnect there? Yeah, there is. So what we've learned is that the, and there's a lot of ma masculinity literature that looks at this, the socialized structure of power in the classroom is one that's white and feminine. So when they engage in the classroom, they oftentimes have to sacrifice their own identities um, or negate their own identities to be successful. If you think about, um, from a masculine standpoint, the boy that is studious, the boy that raises his head and asks, and you know, you know, participates in school, is oftentimes the same boy when you go out in the schoolyard that's teased by his peers, right? And we can take that lens and also look at it from a, a racial perspective and recognize that there's some challenges there. And the last area we look at um, is breadwinner orientation. We know that many men are socialized. Uh, to perceive their primary role is that of a breadwinner. And a quote that I'll have here later on that basically kind of alludes to this, as we were interviewed, uh, uh, actually Frank was doing this one, he interviewed a, a guy who uh, was asking about his experience in college and he was, he was talking about this conflict that he has, like, hey, I'm supposed to be making money for my family and you know, what, how does this school fit into this? And he says, what kind of man who has a wife and two kids quits working so he can go and read poetry at some damn college? Right, and that, thinking about that helps to paint the picture. And then of course, we wanted to focus on institutional responsibility because we felt like you know, a lot of what's taking place is really shifting the blame on the students, their families, their communities, or more commonly what we see is even shifting it on K-12. Oh, well, K-12 didn't prepare them, so you know, what are we supposed to do with these guys? Or they don't care, they're lazy. So there's a lot of that kind of deficit talk, and we're like, you know, that doesn't help anything. Let's focus on what the institution's doing to support them. So we oftentimes use this quote to help contextualize the work that we do. We say, um, and this is work from W. Everett Deming, Paul DeTalden, um, this quote has been attributed to, that every system is perfectly designed to achieve the results that it gets. So when we see deleterious outcomes in all these different areas for males of color, for underrepresented students, for students of color in general, right? we have to ask ourselves, why is that occurring? And from a systems perspective, we think that it's a system. Now, we used to show this when we would go and do trainings with community college faculty, and they'd be like, yeah, you're right, it is the system. You know what, the district office isn't supporting us, and that's why these guys aren't doing well. And we're like, okay, well, maybe it's the district office, or they talk about the state, and they would do anything that they could to basically remove responsibility. So we stopped, we stopped just talking about it as in terms of a system and started talking about it from a more personal perspective and started saying, you know what, every system, every college, Every division, every department, every classroom is perfectly designed to achieve the results that it gets. Then they stop, you know, started getting a little bit more quiet. But <laughs> all right, so <clears throat> this is just a, to help contextualize who we're talking about when we're talking about men of color in community colleges. So there's 947 public two-year institutions in the country. 64 to 65 percent of all black males and Latino males who are in public post-secondary education are in these institutions. 
I felt like this was something that was really important to show um, because when we think about um, men of color and we think about the research base that's on them, most of it doesn't focus on community colleges. But the vast majority of them, if we're looking at this population, that's where they're at. It's not just men of color. Students of color, it's low-income students, students with disabilities. If we're looking at the populations that have been historically underserved in education, the community college is where it's at. That's where the action is taking place, but that's not typically where the research is taking place. Right? The research is oftentimes focusing on men in high-achieving institutions, focusing on foreign institutions, and that work is very important. So I'm not negating the importance of that work. But what I'm also saying is that if we're going to have a focus on this population, we also have to be open to looking at the context to where they're primarily situated. And in fact, this is looking at overall distribution, right? If we look at where they start, right, because we know that some of these guys will end up transferring on, 71 to 72 percent start in the community college. Now, we know that a lot of these guys, again, this is a completely different population. Many of them delay their enrollment into post-secondary education. Remember I said the average age is 28 to 29 years old, right? That means that they're not going directly in. When I used to be a college advisor for Sacramento City College, I would go to the high schools and I would say, hey, you should come to Sacramento City. You know, we got some great programs. I'll link you up with a faculty member, do this, do that. And some of the guys would be like, nah, I'm cool. I don't want to do that. And next, my next response to them would be like, hey, if I don't see you now, I'll see you when you're 30. They would, go, they would pause for a second, I would say like, so why don't we, and I would use it as a way to get guys in, right? And it actually worked, right? Because they started to think about, hey, wait a second. And that's, a, and that's what we see. We see a distribution that looks like that. Now, this is important because the, the delayed enrollment numbers for men of color in community college are higher than that for white males, right? So we know that more of them are delaying their enrollment. We also know that more of them are concentrated in more types of developmental education. So the rates, if you just look at dev ed overall, don't really tell you anything. You have to look at the different types of developmental education. They oftentimes are in more developmental education areas. But one of the reasons that we think that's occurring is because there's more of them who are delaying their enrollment. Imagine going and taking an algebra test six years, seven years, eight years after you last took one. Well, how well would you do? And it's not like um, there's a lot of preparation programs to kind of reorient yourself. So we know that a lot of these guys are doing that. And the last thing I want to point out about this population, you can read some of those stats up there, is that many of them are attending college part time. What do you think the number one reason that is? They're working, right? But get this, the work opportunities that they have are vastly different from that of other students. We did a, an article that came out in the Journal of Men's Studies, and then we did a Huffington Post piece um, talking about that article that you know, kind of translated to popular press. And it was looking at work conditions for men of color in community colleges. We had basically done interviews with guys who are in community colleges and asked them, like, hey, tell me about your work. What is it that you do? Tell me about your experiences. And we learned that there was essentially three key conditions to the type of work opportunities that they had. One, they were in jobs that were physically demanding. Moving boxes, digging ditches, stocking shelves, doing construction site cleanup. Those are common jobs. Second is they were in jobs that occurred late at night. So they're working either the late night shift or the overnight shift. And I can't tell you how many times we've interviewed uh, men of color and they've been, been like, hey, tell me what, what you do. Oh, I clean up construction site. Wow, okay, that's physically demanding. Yeah, it's physically demanding, but you know, I like doing what I do. Oh, great, great. Well, you, what time do you work? Well, I work the late night shift. Well, what time do you get off? 3.30 a.m. What time is your first class? 8 a.m., right? So you can see how, in terms of like the structures, in terms of when we offer our classes, how that could adversely affect certain populations versus others. And then the last thing that we know is that they're in jobs that are transitory in nature, meaning they're in a job for like a month at a time here, and then they're out of that job, and then in another job for a month at a time or two months here, and then they're out of that job and then into another job. So in a given semester, they can be in two, two three, four jobs. So we know in terms of transition theory, the more transitions you're going through, right, the more instability that there is. Imagine continuously going through transitions outside of college while trying to transition and be successful inside of college and how difficult that would be. So recognizing this, you know, we've, we started into c 3 to really do, kind of do research on this and to illuminate the unique experiences of these men of color in community colleges. As part of the work that we do, we have a, essentially a kind of a data warehouse that lists most of the public, 
<clears throat> sorry, most of the publications that have taken place on this population. So if you go to our website, m2c3.org, click on publications, you can, if you're doing your research uh, or dissertation on men of color and community colleges, there's your lit review. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the only thing else I would point out here is um, that a lot of our work is psych psychometric in nature. So a lot of the work that I do is really testing instruments to help measure what um, I think was a definitely said earlier when we were at breakfast. We're trying to measure, I guess, qualitative things in a very quantitative way to show administrators and faculty what's taking place. I thought that was a key insight, so thank you for that. Um, training. Uh, we do a lot of training with community colleges. We have a consortium that we have 72 community colleges that are part of it. They basically, we do uh, monthly professional development webinars. One of the things that I, I recommend to anyone here who is a, a doctoral student who's going into to higher ed, you know, we gotta publish. Publish, 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 publish. That's first and foremost. But then also think about how can you then translate what your work, your uh, learning and working on into practice. And for us, it was doing these webinars. We um, average now 1,000 to 1,500 community college educators who participate in them. We have 72 colleges, they basically, um, put a screen up in a room and then they show the webinar live um, once a month on their campuses uh, to basically look at different topics that are related to men of color and community colleges. We also have them come out, here's a picture to San Diego where we do some like strategic planning and stuff and work with them. Um, these are just uh, some examples of some of the webinars that we've done. Teaching and learning has been a real big one because um, most faculty members do not know how to teach uh, men of color. In fact, let me back up. I'm a, I'm a, let's, let's just be honest here. Most faculty in universities and colleges have not been trained how to teach. They're subject matter experts. Become a faculty member in a community college, this is what you need to have. A master's degree in a discipline. So you've gone, you've got a bachelor's degree in biology, you've got a master's degree in biology, you worked in the field for a little bit, and you're like, hey, I wanna go and teach, and you go into the community college classroom, right? And typically, there's no formal training that people go through, right? Um, especially nationally now, some states used to have credentials, some states have different requirements. But if you look at the national picture, most people don't have any formal training. So what they do then is they pull from their experience, right? I mean, that's what you would do naturally, right? So if I don't know what to necessarily do with this population, I'm gonna do what I was taught. So from their experience, they teach how they were taught. And how they were taught is typically not how our students of color or our men of color learn. And there's a lot of reasons for that and a lot of it deals with, with culture. So we talk about what that looks like. We've done counseling, other things that have taken those same kind of concepts, translated into counseling and advising, building institutional capacity in essentially racist organizations, sometimes, um, to basically how do you move forward an agenda for a population when literally most of the faculty and some of the administration doesn't believe that they should even be there, right? Now they might not consciously like say that, but their actions and the support systems that are in place demonstrate that. Um, and that's just a picture of the working group. Assessment, that's what I'm gonna talk a lot about because what we've tried to do is essentially measure this, okay? So mu much of the research that I, I, I did for the first five, six, seven years of my career has been you know, basic research and then translating that into practice. And now a lot of what I do is designing instruments and validating them, which is lots of fun, as you would imagine. Um, it, it takes a lot of work. So basically, we essentially do three um, instruments with each college that we partner with. And we've partnered in doing data collection with, I think, 68 community colleges at this point. Right, so we're talking about a lot, and they haven't all been in California. California, Arizona, uh, Illinois, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Arkansas, Texas, Georgia, Alabama, like, so like, I think about nine states. So we do a student survey, which basically is distributed to all students on campus, not all students, but to all students of all racial, ethnic um, affiliation and gender, to randomly selected course sections. They complete it, it's a Scantron instrument, and then we use that to essentially show the college how students are experiencing the institution. We have a, a self-assessment tool that um, essentially staff members take, and then we have a, a faculty instrument which looks at 
instructional practices. So we did a study where we interviewed uh, faculty members who had a proven record of success in teaching men of color. And they, we had some, some certain requirements that we looked at in terms of how, how they fit our definition. And then what we did was we did a book essentially that highlighted the practices that were important. A lot of it dealt with relationship building, a lot of it dealt with teaching and learning. It's called Teaching Men of Color in the Community College. And then what we did was we developed an instrument to essentially measure our faculty members doing this so that when we partner with the college, we can help guide them in doing professional development based upon the research literature that's taking place. So let me talk a little bit about this uh, student survey. So what we did in terms of developing is we start out with the research literature. What, is it, what do we know is important for success for men of color? And it was a lot of different things. It's looking at the campus climate, it's looking at engagement, looking at um, non-cognitive outcomes, self-efficacy, local of control, intrinsic interests. One of the things that we found that really wasn't um, highlighted in the literature and even actually in the literature had a negative effect on success was social involvement. If you want to ask about that later, I can tell you why that is. Um, and so we used that to essentially as a framework to start. And then we went through, and this is the, the essentially validating processes that we went through with just two of our instruments. Um, and this stuff is ongoing. Like literally every day I'm on my computer doing more analyses on it, trying to tweak our questions, trying to think about, okay, how are these things holding together? And what you'll find is that when you go to colleges, a lot of times someone's just created an instrument, right, an IR, and then they use it on campus. Nine times out of 10, any instrument that's just been created one time and has, is being used doesn't measure anything. Right? It takes years of work to be able to uh, have an instrument that really effectively measures what you're trying to get at. And so this is the process that we went through. We started out doing face validity with a panel of experts after we created the initial version of the instrument. We then piloted it with uh, several colleges that uh, looked at essentially are the items and scales uh, holding together, are they reliable? Also, are they reliable across ethnic groups, right? Which was really important for the work that we were doing. We had to make some tweaks, all right? We had to make some changes, and we did. And then we did another pilot, right? With, a, with a, a, another couple institutions, and we did that same process, looking at how everything held together. And then we recognized that, you know what? Some of this stuff is just not holding together right. We need to go back to the drawing board. So we created some new scales for some of the ones that just weren't doing well. We went back out and basically did what's called content validation where you send the instrument to a panel of experts and you say, hey, these items are designed to measure self-efficacy. Here's our definition of self-efficacy. Do you think that they measured them, right? And, we have, and there's different ways that you do that. And essentially we got you know, some changes that were made to our instrument as a result of that. We then went out for another round, right? And, <coughs> and have continued to do this process ongoing um, since 2011, right? And if you were to ask me today, is the instrument done? Is it where it needs to be? Nope, maybe in a few years, right? And we do the same thing with the, essentially our, our faculty instrument as well. This is what we used to give colleges with reports, okay? We used to like do all these really nice, fancy reports for them, right? So this is looking at essentially uh, their, their sense of belonging as it relates to their experiences with faculty members, right? So we did some, some analysis of variance work to look at differences between groups. We wanted to show them dispersion scores, and we're oftentimes talking about, about that with some box plots. Uh, we had all kinds of like nice bells and whistles and things. The report was about 150 pages, right? Um, so. We partnered with the first, I would say, 50 institutions before we realized this wasn't working. And nobody was reading the report. Let's keep it real. No one was reading it. And those who did read it were still even confused. Like, the only person who usually like, understood what it was was the IR person, right? <laughs> so we recognized, like, OK, we have to find a way to translate what's really important concepts in a way that essentially Anybody on campus can just look at it who's a practitioner and read it and get it. Because this was not working, right? I mean, literally, we weren't even getting email confirmations that they had received it. <laughs> I'm serious. So this is what we transitioned to, a triage report. Same items, same scales, but with benchmarks for each of the different areas, right? 
so this is like, for example, our sense of belonging scales as it relates to their, their interactions with faculty, the faculty member cares about, my perspective, values interacting with me, values my presence, cares about my success, believes I belong here. And then, and this is fake data, by the way. We don't show, I don't show the, the real data. I'll show you a couple of pieces of real data uh, at some point here, but not this. Um, and basically we have three levels. It's the score is acceptable, the score is a needs attention, or it's an immediate concern, right? So it's essentially a triage. These are the things that you should be focusing on for, it used to be that we only did men, but now we do men and women. And almost to, almost like to 100%, I can guarantee you what we're gonna see when we go to a campus. We see variation, don't get me wrong, we see variation. Um, but usually what we'll find is that in terms of validation, students are not being validated by their faculty, particularly our men of color. In terms of out of class interactions, they're not occurring, and more importantly, students think that the faculty members don't even want to interact with them, right? In terms of perceptions of racial preference, our black, Latino, and Middle Eastern students feel like their faculty members really don't want to interact with them and have stereotypes towards them, right? Um, in terms of non-cognitive outcomes, there are certain challenges with help seeking that vary across group. Okay? So we, we know what the, the patterns are starting to look like nationally, and these patterns really for us um, have important implications for the kind of practice that needs to take place. We also give them predictive analyses, and this is actually a real one, and where we basically, um, we had to figure out a way, how do you translate like for faculty members, a one pager that says, this is what you should be focused on for each of these different groups in your class, right? Right, thinking about your racial bias, how you do, you know, how do you build an environment of belonging? So what we did was we translated essentially p-values into check marks, okay? So significant at 0 0.05, 0 0.01, 0 0.001 was one check mark, two check marks, three check marks, and we told them that to view it as Important, very important, and extremely important, right? And why is that? Because that's essentially what it, you can talk to them about that they would understand and be able to use. And so they get three of these, one for faculty, one for student services, and one for those who are working in retention programs with all that non-cognitive stuff that we look at. This is our one for faculty. Again, it's a simple triage report. So we have essentially acceptable area of concern or immediate attention, green, yellow, red. Everybody remembers this from elementary school, right? Red light, green light. <laughs> so red light means bad. You have to focus on this for your professional development, on racial microaggressions, on performance monitoring, on validating practices. Green are areas of, uh, that they're doing well in, and yellow is areas that they should also be focused on after they focus on the areas that are in red. The campuses that, that, that we've done this with, you, you're probably not surprised what comes up as the biggest issues. It's validation. Uh, they don't, they oftentimes, the faculty members really just don't believe that they should be doing it. Uh, performance monitoring and intrusive practices. One of the things that we find is that faculty members think that in some ways, if I'm being intrusive in, in providing support to a student, that I'm then being unfair to the other students in the class. And so getting past um, that notion of what is viewed as equality, which oftentimes results in disparities for our students, and talking to them about equity becomes important. So we've also, in terms of the data collection thus far, this is what we've done. We've done uh, the CCSM, that's that community college, it used to be called a community college survey of amendments, it's a student survey, now it's the community college success measure, at 68 community colleges with over 17,000 students. We've done 30 focus groups with, with students, all, those are all men of color focus groups, for a total of 104 people that we've interviewed, 12 institutions, 50 faculty interviews, and then our faculty survey, about 2,000 folks. So the, co the comments that, I, that I've given and the comments I'm gonna continue to give, they're informed by all this work that we've been doing, right? It's a lot, we kinda, I, you, you could uh, view it as one very large study or a whole bunch of micro studies that are very interrelated, but they're all undergirded by one thing and that's this, our socio-ecological outcomes model. So this is a theoretical framework that we developed based upon the literature on, on men of color and other underserved groups and it informs basically everything that we do, right? So this is our theory, this is our theoretical framework. Uh, this is our conceptual model, actually it started as a conceptual model, I think with, I would now say it's a theoretical framework. So basically, it follows a simple IEO approach, inputs, experiences, outcomes, 
inputs are those things that occur um, prior to prior to the community college. So their age, time status, these are kind of like background defining factors. These are some societal factors. Then we look at four domains in the middle and how those relate to student success. So now I'm going to walk you through a couple pieces of this and talk, tell you about some of the things that we found in, in terms of our research. So you'll see that each one of these, I'll take each one of these boxes, except I'm not going to do the background one. So we know that society matters, right? So we know that for a lot of these guys, they experience um, stereotypes in the classroom and on campus. Um, I did a study um, where we had done interviews with, uh, there was a focus on 28 black males and asked them about their experiences in, in the classroom. And one of the things that they, we learned in that study is that the men um, were not necessarily engaged in the classroom, right? Some people would call it disengagement, but we didn't want to call it disengagement because there was more to it there than not, not wanting to participate and not caring. It was something deeper than that. So what we did was the first question was, was asking them generally about what affects their success in school. And they said, well, I don't really participate as much in the class as I should. It's like, oh, really? Well, that's interesting. Can you tell me what that looks like? They say, well, if a faculty member asks a question, I'll know the answer, but I won't say anything. Or if they ask, does anyone have any questions? And they've just gone over a new concept. And you know what? I know that I need to ask them about it. I won't say anything. And they'll say, hey, if, if anybody needs any support, come to my office hours and, and you can get some support. And I'll know I need to go, but I won't go. And they said, well, why is that? And they said, well, they'll think I'm dumb. They'll think I'm ignorant. They'll think I'm stupid. And this is one of the ones that also came out of that. I needed the most help on my writing and the teacher was looking at me like, oh, here we go. We got another R kid in the class now. So that was other things that they were worried about being, being viewed as. So a lot of it dealt with what we would refer to as essentially stereotype threat. They were worried that by engaging in the classroom, there would be chances that maybe they would get something wrong and they would essentially refi stereotypes that they were academically inferior. But it was more than that. It was also an environment that fostered that. The students' quotes in terms of how they talked about their faculty's interactions with them inside of class and outside of class reified that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. This is a, record for, uh, a quote from the MDRC. They did a, they had a whole bunch of focus groups with men of color in community colleges. They looked at black, Latino, and Native American men. It was a really awesome report, super long, but very good. And they said that um, men of color routinely experience stereotypical attitudes, attitudes that link them to thuggery and violence, among many other negative associations. According to these men, race remains central to their experiences, and their reality is distant from that of a post-racial society. Next thing that we've looked at is a lot of work on non-cognitive outcomes. Um, we know that there's a lot of programs that are many community colleges that focus on, hey, let's, let's help build students' self-esteem or their self-efficacy or, or have them get a, a greater sense of control over what they're doing. And so we, we look at that as part of our work. Um, and this is a quote that helps, that came from one of our focus groups that kind of illustrates why we look at a concept called degree utility, which is essentially their perception of the usefulness of college in comparison to every other thing that they could be doing. And a student said, I worry that being here is not worth it because I see a lot of people that graduated with, from college with all sorts of degrees and still can't get a job and are still struggling. So I'm like, damn, I spent all this money on student loans. What's going to happen if I don't get a job? And those are real concerns that these guys have. I talked a lot already about masculinity, so I'm not going to go into talking about the other types of identities, but I will read these two quotes. This first one came from a piece that Frank did with Sean Harper. Uh, it's called Masculinities Go to Community College. If you don't have a chance to read anything, anything else that we've done, even though I'm not on this piece, read this piece. This piece is hot, right? In fact, it's one of those times like we read something like, dang, I wish I'd been on that one. <laughs> so this is that one that was that quote I talked about earlier. What kind of man has two kids and quits working so he can go read poetry at some damn college? That's, degree to, that's, that's looking at the role that breadwinner orientation has on their success. And this one over here is kind of getting at this notion of help seeking. And this is done by Victor Sines and uh, Luis Pong Juan. They have a center in Texas that does similar work um, that if you're interested, particularly in Latino males, I would check it out. It says, yeah, I also come, it also comes from a sense of pride. You know, you're always taught to be a man and you're proud. 
And if you fall, if you stumble, then that's your own fault. You don't bring anyone down with you. You don't ask for help because it's your doing. You shouldn't have to ask anybody for help. So it's just that sense of pride that carries over that in the end makes you fail. I want to spend a little bit of time here, but not too much. And this is on stressful um, life events and other external outcomes that influence their success. I already told you some things about the type of work conditions that we learned. And that work conditions piece was uh, published in the International Journal of Qualitative Studies and, and Education. Um, so if you're interested in looking at that one. Um, but no, I'm sorry. That was published in Journal of Men's Studies. The International Journal of Qualitative Studies was that one about apprehension to engage. So, we know that finances are an issue. Transportation is an issue. Here's a quote that kind of gets at that from one of our students that we interviewed. I have to take three buses to get to school. Transportation is a real concern. If I miss one bus or one bus runs late, it means that I don't make it to class on time. Yeah, I spend like an hour, sometimes an hour and a half, just getting to school. And so we would have faculty members who would oftentimes ask us, well, hey, he's always late to class. Well, one bus runs late, one bus leaves early, it can affect your schedule. And so these are things that at least to know, right? It might not change how you grade, but it can change how you interact with them and not view it as, oh, they're just lazy and they don't care. The other thing is we look at this concept called stressful life events, and this, and this morning I actually ran a little bit of extra data on it in terms of what we're finding out with it. So historically what we've done with our student survey is we've measured stressful life events in a couple of ways. We've asked them in the past two years how many of these experiences have you had? And we give different types of experiences of stressful life events. We ask them about divorce, eviction, a major relationship breakup, uh, death of a close family member or friend, incarceration. And on average, we know that from our samples across all the institutions we partner with, that black and Latino males experience four to five major stressful life events that they report to us. And about 20% of our Latino males, which is the highest group for this area, uh, experience the top end of our scale, which is seven or more stressful life events in that same time frame. We moved away from measuring it like that to measuring it in a different way, which has been really insightful and, and helped us. So now what we do is we give different examples because we're really interested in the role that maybe hunger has in this. I can relate to that. When I was a student who was in college, um, I didn't have anything to eat. You know, um, I, I went off to school. I had a, a family structure of support. My dad went to prison. It was just me and my brother. And so literally, I, I starved for about two years. I ate like every other day if I could eat. And if I, if I couldn't, I found a campus event that was taking place that had some free pizza. And I went to that because that was the way that I, I basically maintained and sustained. So I was really interested in that and also interested in challenges that a lot of these guys have with um, finding stable places to live, right? So in the, this new way that we collect it, we see that 67% of our black males report having challenges with a stable place of living. And of those, 79% say that it's, it has, it's, stressful, it's stressful and it has an effect on their success. 47% report challenges with hunger. And of those, 70% say that that has a str that it's stressful. 37% report challenges with transportation concerns. 90% of those say that those concerns are stressful and affect their success. And the last area is stable employment. 60% report challenges with stable employment. 94% say that that causes stress. So the last area I want to talk about is what we know and what we're learning about uh, this last area, which is the campus climate and sense of belonging. Because I know I'm out of time. So one more minute. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so campus ethos. We know that the climate matters on our campuses. And we, what we've done is we've dedicated our research careers to trying to figure out how do we measure this and package it in a way that campuses can understand that can change and inform their practice. Right? So we look at sense of belonging, but not very much in a traditional way, as opposed to, you know, students are typically asked, you know, do you feel like you're connected to this campus? Do you feel like you have friendships? Uh, that's more integration, but belonging, looking at do you feel connected? Do you feel valued? 
And what we look at instead is their perceptions of other people. Do my faculty members believe I belong here, care about me, do they care about my success, do staff members? We look at it in that way because we're trying to get at this understanding of institutional responsibility. It's not about whether they feel like they belong there, we want that, but we want to know that they're being educated by people who care about them, want them to be there, and are communicating to them in ways that essentially illustrates their value. Uh, we look at racial gender stereotypes, we look at welcomeness to engage, which I'll come back to, because I'll conclude with that. And one of the things we look at is validation, the presence of validating messages that they receive. We ask them, essentially, the total number of faculty members that they experience or have interactions with who tell them, and we give them examples of different types of, of, of validating messages that they can receive. And what we find is that about 33% of our black males have never received a validating message from a faculty member. And there's also, of course, the opposite end of the scale where there are, are percentages of them who are receiving lots of it. But there's about a third, 33%, a third, essentially, right, that aren't receiving it at all. One of the things that we've looked at is what role does this validation have on their success? And what we've seen is this. Those stressful life events that we looked at, the effect that those have on their success ev almost evaporate when, when we run models looking at the role that validation has on their success. When we, we've done um, studies where we've looked at non-cognitive outcomes, uh, looking at uh, self-efficacy, locus of control, degree utility, intrinsic interests, action control, and in fact, it's a paper we're working on right now, and this, this one's actually focused on uh, Latino males, specifically Mexican-American men, and we find that essentially, it's like this almost like a converging point where they have about four faculty members who give them those messages, the, the scales like essentially shoot up on those non-cognitive outcomes. And so for us, we think what it's getting at is, this, is, is being educated in an environment where you're receiving multiple messages from, from people that are essentially negating all that prior messaging that you've received that has told you that you don't belong here, you're not good enough, you're not smart. The last thing I'll say and then I'll conclude is we look at this concept called welcomeness to engage. Now, a lot of times we talk about engagement, right? Engagement's important. Okay, um, it's used so much and talked about so much, it's almost become like a synonym for student success. Um, you know, you go to a campus and they talk about student success, they talk about retention, they talk about engagement, almost as if they are the same exact things, right? Now, what I've become concerned about is that when we focus solely on this, sometimes we assume that some things are taking place that aren't always there and aren't always occurring. So with engagement, some of the times what you'll see is like, an, uh, is like different assessments, like I'll go to a community college and they've created an assessment, right, to measure engagement. And they'll say, how often is a student asking questions in class, responding to questions in class, participating in group discussions? Without ever thinking about something much more fundamental, and that is, have they ever been made you know, to feel welcome to engage? Do you feel welcome to ask questions, respond to questions, participate in group discussions? Do you feel welcome to talk to your faculty member outside of class? And what we found from our, from our assessments is that that is not the case. In particular, what we've seen as the most concerning area is welcomeness to engage outside of class. They are not having experiences that make them feel welcome to engage outside of class. In that same study where we interviewed those 28 men, what we found out was this. Um, is that when they would be outside of class and they would be walking on the yard, they would see a faculty member, a faculty member would see them. The faculty member, instead of saying hi, saying hello, talking with them, would put their head down, would walk the other direction, would pretend to get on their phone, right, to avoid interacting with them. And then so we asked them in that same study as a follow-up, well then who are you, who do you interact with who's from campus? And they would say, you know what, the person who tells me that you, know, you belong here, you're doing great work, proud of you young man, keep your heads in the books, it was the janitor, the custodian, the food service workers. And why do you think that is, most likely? Probably the people who look most like them. Right? So we know that there's climates that influence student success, and we know that the, and so what we've tried to do is measure this in ways that we think are meaningful, and I have tons more, but I'm out of time, and so I'm gonna stop right there. Thanks. <laughs>
Hello. My name is Lisa Perez, actually from California. So I have a 20 year old son who's at South Bay State right now. Okay. So love your presentation. It all made sense to me because I think one of the things that I noticed that when he was going to graduate high school and go to San Jose State was they were really concentrated. He didn't have any access to any resources because he was considered first generation, I mean second generation. So I found that to be problematic because if they're saying that black and Latino males are underrepresented in higher education, you know, they, I agree, they need to um, concentrate on other factors that affect them in these kind of settings because because he was now second generation, because I graduated a year before he went to San Jose State, he was excluded from all these resources and pretty much left on his own. But because I had just graduated from there, I had made all these connections for him. So you were able to use your capital yeah, to get him in. Yeah, for that, to help him in that case. But had I not done that, right? Had I not, had he come from a mother who, or parents who didn't have that experiences, then he would pretty much have been on his own. And so even that he has these type of resources with me, and I know that camp as well, he still, you know, a lot of these experiences make sense to me because not only does he experience them in, at San Jose State in high school as well, right? Yeah. So I just want to say thank you there. I just found it really important. Thank you. Appreciate that. You don't feel shy if you have to go. It's all good. Yeah. Yeah. So we do the assessment with them. And then typically what the assessment says is, as like the number one thing that they need to do is you got to really do some professional development with your faculty. So everywhere we go, the number one thing we recommend is pervasive, intensive, ongoing professional development for all your faculty and staff members, part timers and full timers. Um, and so we usually assist them with that process of either doing face to face. Uh, professional development. We also have an online uh, center um, that we run that basically does virtual professional development for faculty. It's called a CORE, Center for Organizational Responsibility and Advancement, and we do um, online one-week professional developments and essentially get a certificate in teaching men of color um, that is super in-depth and I feel like it's a, a pretty powerful training. There's about 40 community colleges now that are um, participating in it and have made it available to all of their faculty and staff. So a lot of it looks like that. Some campuses invite us in to do more. And when they invite us in to do more, we're like, okay, great. So <laughs> what that looks like is we do what's called equity root cause analysis. So we do break them up into academic families. Um, so like we'll do an academic family that's focused on science and so we might get biology, chemistry and physics together or we might get some of, some of the social sciences. So it's a little bit smaller than just like discipline uh, or disciplinary areas but they're like families. And we'll get them in a room and we'll basically start out with okay what is a major challenge that's facing your students, your students of color. And based upon the assessment data they have in from, front of them that their IR gives them, okay they're not graduating at this rate or they're not persisting at this rate in these classes. Okay, great. So we start out there. And then we say, okay, so let's go next. So what is the reason you think that's occurring? And we let them get it out because what they're gonna say is, well, they're not trying hard, they're working too much, they're this, they're this, or that. We let them get that out and we just kind of sit there. They're noticing that we're not writing anything down, <laughs> right? And then we say, okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to actually engage in this exercise and here's the, the, the acceptable language. You have to start out your sentence with we are or we are not, right? Completely shifting the focus to what they are or they aren't doing. And then we go through essentially a root cause analysis, identifying different reasons why it's occurring until we get down to what we call root causes. And then we do planning with them on essentially how they're going to create interventions for those root causes. So the first part is the equity root cause, which is one day. The second day we do the, the basically a planning framework on how they're going to do their inter interventions. And then the third day we do uh, a training on essentially planning implementation. So you can have a plan, but oftentimes the plan sit on the shelf. So how are you going to get it into practice? Who's going to do what? How are they going to do it? Um, and so we, then we follow that process with them. And then usually they're also doing like the core training at the same time. So for the campuses that we're really partnering with, that's the process that they're going through. Yeah, the, the next one was over here, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I was wondering with the colleges that you've worked with um, in, in terms of professional development, do you then after the professional development is over per se, 
Do you look for improvement when you go back? Have you collected any data to see how they've improved in these so, areas? So yes, we do to an extent. So here's the challenge. Usually when a college is doing something that's focused on, on men of color, um, it's part of a, a, of a greater equity initiative and there's lots of other things going on. And so we're real cautious about coming in and being like, hey, look, we were the, the, you know, the silver bullet because it's more, usually more the silver buckshot, right? And we're just one of the small pieces. So what we do instead um, is we do essentially pre-post tests for those who participate in the training. And then we provide the colleges with the results from that um, across all the different areas and then they have that that they usually include in their reporting. Now, for the colleges, some of the colleges, bless you, they're in California, they also have outcomes that they're looking at over time, and so we do monitor those outcomes. So that's how we're doing it. Right here and then right here. My question real quick. Geographically, do you work in the Florida area, Northeast, or is so, it mostly concentrated with South? Oh, so a lot of, okay, just re, because we're in San Diego, we get a lot of California colleges, a lot of Arizona colleges. Um, we also, but we've done colleges in other states. Well, we have worked with colleges in Florida, much more complex, <laughs> uh, particularly w w uh, for the stuff that you were talking about earlier with Latino males and what that means in Florida or Hispanic male in Florida is completely different than what it means in our context. So, um, but we, we have worked with colleges in Florida, South um, Broward College, South Campus. Um, there's a couple colleges that have invited us in. Um, and then we've worked with colleges, I think you said Northeast, we've worked with colleges in Maryland, a um, couple of institutions there. So um, in terms of the most intensive partnerships, we, usually those campuses just really want us to do the survey and give them the results and they're gonna try to figure it out and maybe they'll participate in the online training. But for the cal colleges that uh, really want us to come in, we're like, hey, we'll, we'll do it, we'll help, you know, because there's a lot to be done and it's big, the problem is so much bigger than, than we can even ha handle, you know, so we do what we can. Yes? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. I guess I'll just kind of follow up to that. Um, so when you do evaluation at the end of, um, let's say, you propose a timeline for doing some kind of faculty vote, and then you go back to do, um, like outcome assessment. Uh -huh. Then is it the case that the college invites you back or you propose time as at I maybe mean, after one year or two years maybe we would like to you kind of close and look at your current state? That's that's a great question. So we used to just kind of do like one and done things and we've learned that that was kind of a waste of time. So, I mean, we're, we're continuing to learn through this process. So I don't want you to see like, hey, nice PowerPoint, so everything's perfect, because it's not. It's, me it's messy. Um, so, but what we've transitioned to is this. Now when we do our survey, um, we are basically transitioning to it will be done every other year at the campus. So that we can then look at change over time with different populations. So that was actually the original intention from the beginning, but then we just drifted away from it because people are like, hey, we want you to do it once and then take off. But, you all, but it, what you said, for some reason, brought to mind like this, this, the, the challenge that, we, that is kind of oftentimes the biggest challenge, and that's with the faculty that we work with. So one of the recommendations that we regularly give, it has nothing to do with what you said, it just triggered it in my mind, so I'm gonna go on a tangent real quick. One of the things that um, we saw and have seen is that with a lot of these guys, they're in classes that are being taught by part-time faculty. And typically part-time faculty, they're teaching at multiple institutions. So there's a, the challenge there. For example, we just went and talked to a college in um, the Bay Area. I can keep it general like that. They do not have a single full-time faculty member that teaches developmental education, right? And we know that that's the highest concentration of them. And so one of the things that we do is we try to illuminate that. So check this out. This is from our faculty survey, right? This looks at, um, basically, these are full-time faculty full-time faculty who are tenure track, full-time faculty who are not tenure track, part-time faculty who are teaching here only, part-time faculty teaching at multiple institutions. And we know that from our data, from our assessments, that they're across the campuses, either two times or 2.5 times more likely to be teaching the developmental education remedial courses. This is basically faculty members who are intentional about practices that foster a welcomeness to engage. Look at the pattern over here with the part-timers, right? This is inside a class, this is outside a class. It's to be expected because it's not the only thing that they're doing, but for this population, the most important thing that they need are relationships, and they are 
concentrated in classes with faculty members who literally don't have the time to be able to do it. So it's like the best, or not maybe necessarily the best faculty, but the faculty members who actually have that time, they refuse to teach it. We see many institutions will even, they'll even hire a full-time faculty to teach dev ed, and as soon as they get tenure, boom, I'm out of that. And then more part-time faculty come filtering in. Maybe we'll take one more question. One more, and then we gotta wrap. I have a question about like, state. Are you um, receiving any interest from like state governing and coordinating boards? Uh, on the of the coordinating of, uh, I know uh, IBHG or ICHG one a couple years ago they specifically said that they need to be better at supporting the color. So are you saying it's just in an institutional context or is it beginning to expand? It's such an interesting question. So how we ended up doing the, this work with the colleges directly is because we could never get any funding to do this work. We never received funding from a foundation. We received, we have one very, very small grant that we have from a, a private foundation that focuses on African Americans. Um, never received any funding from a, a philanthropic organization, never received any funding from a state. Because, and you know what? We tried doing that and we tried doing that, never got any funding. We were doing the work for free. And it was challenging because you know we have other things that we're doing. I'm a full-time faculty member, right? And it wasn't until we said, you know what? We talked to a real good colleague of ours. His name is Chance Lewis. He's a faculty member at UNC Charlotte. I say Greensboro, it's Charlotte. And he said, you know what? You all should do a service model because th this is a service that they need. I was like, okay. I said, well, what does that mean? He's like, well, you should tell the colleges this is the surveys that you have, and then you should go in and do that work, and then partner with them to help them do what they need to do because, you know, they obviously need the help and. If they're really concerned about it, they'll help to essentially fund the fund the essentially the evaluation. So we moved to that model, and we've never looked back. And we, there was you know one time where we were talking with the state of California about doing it, and the person who was in the position ended up politics. They ended up moving on, and so the only opportunity we ever had to do something that might have been state level was there. So no, no state funding, no state partnerships. No foundation funding, no foundation partnerships. Our work is directly with the colleges. And in some ways, that's better. Because if they're saying that this is important, they're inviting us in right, to come partner with them, there's probably a commitment to do something more than just rhetoric. 